All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, right now we're gonna have a keynote by Jeff Manber. Uh, he has quite an extensive uh, resume with, with experience and utilis utilization in, uh, in LEO in both manned and unmanned space. Uh, he started at Pan AmSat, which was the first privately owned international satellite venture um, and was quite involved in helping the American and Russian space programs uh, partner during the 90s. And now he's firing CubeSats out of the ISS um, with <laughs> Nano. Yeah, uh, which, is, which is totally awesome. And um, they're not only working with CubeSats, but they're also doing uh, space station payloads. And they've done a great job of working themselves uh, into the press. Uh, recently this week, they announced a partnership with Blue Origin to help uh, them do scientific payloads on suborbital flights. Also uh, used a lot in in the language within NASA and and really regarded in in a, in a high sense. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, and let's all give him a warm welcome. Okay, uh, is the mic on? Is the mic on? Is the mic on? And is it working? Yeah, yeah. Working? Okay, I have something. Um, Everybody for coming out on a Saturday, and I, I first want to say uh, just give a you know a shout out to all the uh, volunteers. We saw them on stage before. I just think they're doing a great job. I think this is one of the best new space conferences I've been to, and I, I think everyone involved should feel very proud about how well it's going. Um, what I wanted to do this morning was was talk about space stations. And uh, what have we learned? I mean, we, we isolate ourselves so much. You know, people today are looking at International Space Station, and we're looking at utilization at Nanorax. We're focused a lot on how you can use International Space Station. But we don't really think about, well, what were the lessons from the MIR? Hey, what happened from the MIR? What can we take from the MIR that applies to ISS, and what can we take from ISS that takes us to the next levels? So I thought I would just take a few minutes uh, here and just talk about just personally from my perspective and then we have a, a panel after this where we really have some good people talking about where do we go next uh, with space stations. So first let me start by saying the obvious for everybody in, the, in, in this business that rockets are cool, okay? And something else that's new, there's lots of them. And this is really new and, and you know we've never had before so many launch vehicles that are available for use. And of course, as we all know, there are so many more coming. And in, in my view, if even half the launch vehicle that we hear about come to fruition, to operational status, we will have so many opportunities to get to low Earth orbit and beyond. Those are commercial vehicles, there'll be competition, they'll be going to different orbits, and the question is, you know, where are they going to go? And that's what brings up space stations. And of course, we had the lunar program. Um, but right now, I see the coming of a golden era, a golden time, where with the operational launch vehicles, with commercial pricing, with taking the learn from space stations, there's no doubt in my mind that we can envision in five to ten years a lot of choices as to where we go uh, in space. And so, for now, this morning, I just want to talk about space stations. And this is a presentation I put together a little quickly, just wanted to divide things out. I mean, we had Salyut, we had Skylab, those had zero commercial utilization. And then we had the Mir, and we had the International Space Station, both of which had commercial use. And I've been real lucky because I marketed and did business development for both the Mir and now the International Space Station. And first I, I worked with RKK Energia, the Russian organization that's today the prime uh, integrator on the Russian side for space station. And I worked with them on the business development for the Mir. And that was about 94, 96, around that time. And then I worked, uh, I was head of Mir Corp, uh, the Dutch company at the turn of the century, which leased the Mir space station for about two years. And 
each experience, I've really had three different chapters in looking at space stations. And I've taken away and am taking away, f you know, from ISS today, different parts of the puzzle. And for me, the end game is, how do we do this commercially, purely commercially? And is that possible? So first, I think there's an asterisk there. Yeah, this comes, I think it says, uh, yeah, this comes from my memory and observation. This is not written in stone, these numbers. This is just something. Uh, so uh, Jeff Faust, don't tweet these as the Bible. You know, but it's, it's interesting as I sat down and, and, and just uh, uh, thought about it. One of the striking things and the vast disagreement always between the American side and the Russian side was to the Russians sending astronauts to the station is a commercial venture. And when they reached that agreement with ESA, where ESA would pay to have their astronauts go to the Mir, it overturned the entire, at that time, 40-year history where it was done diplomatically. And to the Russians, uh, to Energia specifically, it was business. Energia is providing a service. We have a customer. The customer is ESA. And today, the Russians view it the same way. They work with ESA, they work with NASA, they provide a service, sending astronauts to and from the International Space Station. So one of the first things that struck me when I put together this chart was that the, uh, the uh, ESA crew on Mir was probably uh, the largest source of revenue uh, for the Russians. Um, space tourism, and these are just guesses, and. It's not really an honest number, but I don't know if I'm still under NDAs after 20 years, but I don't know. I didn't want to go through honest numbers. But um, fair amount, this is during the time uh, of working with Energia. We had some advertising. We did an Israeli uh, milk commercial. We did uh, a couple of other things. And just guessing, it was about $8 million, And we had some biopharma. And it's interesting to see uh, how uh, young uh, Earth observation, you'll see on the International Space Station, Earth observation is really maturing uh, today, and I only see more of that coming. And then at MirCorp, uh, uh, of course, the Europe, European Space Agency and NASA disliked what we were doing at uh, MirCorp, so they, we lost the uh, commercial crew, uh, but we had media and branding. And we had signed uh, with um, Mark Burnett of Survivor and NBC, where the, uh, uh, the, the winner would go to space. We had uh, signed Dennis Tito. Uh, we had uh, a space agency that still I don't talk about that agreed to fly with us. Uh, we had a deal with uh, Fox, the, the uh, Murdoch family, uh, where uh, they, they would do, um, we would do cosmonauts doing weather broadcasting during weather emergencies. Okay, so, so you see there, we had a, a, the space tourism, which was the Dennis Tito flight, uh, and we had media and branding. And, and so you see immediately that the two major markets during, on the Mir were the commercial services to get folks up there and back, and media. And then when you look at the ISS, and then again, as I say, this was just taken, uh, you know, uh, fairly quickly. Again, you see, I'm just guessing, there's probably been close to a billion dollars that has been transferred uh, to Roscosmos uh, from the U.S. And, and the Europeans for, uh, there was 21 ESA astronauts, I think, and, and I didn't, as I said, I did this quickly, I don't know how many, NASA. Um, you got the satellite deployment, Nanorax has taken the lead on the ISS and, and deploying small sats. I know uh, the Japanese have had some commercial projects, Earth observation, when you look at what Earthcast is doing but on both the Russian side uh, and now uh, with Nanorax on the American side, it probably has a valuation, uh, uh, probably is costing about $100 million. Uh, you got Space Adventures still doing the Space Tourists. Um, and now you're beginning to see more diverse. And the point here, obviously Nanorax is not involved in all these, but on the retail level, now we have high schools going, we have universities going. Uh, we have biopharmaceutical companies, and we've never had such a range of commercial utilization uh, on space stations. We didn't have that on the Mir, and uh, really through Nanoracks, we're getting to see a uh, diversity. But it's an interesting diversity in that, and, and here's some of my friends in the industry and at NASA may disagree with me, but for example, we have DL DLR as a customer at times. I count them as commercial. We have ESA as a customer today. I count them as commercial. 
And the reason I count them as commercial is we didn't answer an RFP. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, they come to us for a service to use our hardware that we own, and I treat them no differently than, than anyone is treated in any industry. And whether you're with the, a government or whether you're with a commercial sector or university, you're agreeing in this case to use Nanorax hardware uh, for a service, and if we don't perform, we don't get paid. And so for me, this distinction in the industry, uh, we can't, you know, na uh, you know, if NASA's a customer, it's not commercial. I think that's a ridiculous uh, distinction. Um, uh, uh, you know, if it's commercial and they're paying for services, uh, it works for me. So, so Mircorp in 18 months produced more business uh, outside of the, uh, of the crew transportation than in the previous years with the same space station. And, and why is that? And the answer is, it was a better story, it was more commercial. And there were things we could do. We could do things like this. You can't do that today. Okay, uh, you know, I was involved in the Pizza Hut, for those who remember that. And, and uh, when you have a commercial system, when you, it, when you talk about today with NASA folks and they say, how can you think about having a commercial system? Really, when you begin to look at the entire range of meteorites, uh, you know, who controls the launch vehicles? Who's controlling the, the, uh, the crew on board? Is it a government crew? Are they private citizens? When you begin to look at the whole puzzle together, uh, you can begin to see that revenue levels, utilization, excitement, um, uh, relevance to society goes way, way up. Up to now, we've only seen glimmers of this. A little bit with the mirror. We're seeing it a little bit with ISS. But we're not there. We have not had a commercial platform uh, yet. Um, so one of the interesting things is uh, a, a lot of people come in and say, oh, man, the revenue from the commercial sector on ISS is, you know, what have you done? 20 million, 30 million worth of business. But there's another part of that puzzle, and that's what's the valuation that's been created. And I'm really, really pleased how well NASA and Congress gets this. NASA completely gets today that what we're doing on the station with Planet Labs creates jobs. Creates, it creates a valuation. You go to their, uh, to their facilities uh, up the road here and you see everybody just building those CubeSats and everything going on. Never mind, they're probably along EarthCast and Spy you know, they're going to change the way we view the Earth. From a very pragmatic hard-nosed way that Congress looks at things and hence NASA has to look at things. Uh, you look, the metric for me in working commercial is different than working with research. In research, they look at patents, they look at, you know, how many scientists or how many announcements are being made. For me, uh, the, va the, the valuation of the customers is a and if we were failing at NanoRacks, then Planet Labs would have been delayed a couple of years in, in realizing their ambitions. And, and uh, EarthCast, which started, oops, uh, EarthCast, which started on the Russian side, would not have a valuation of probably about 400 million. These are just guesses. I, you know, I just, uh, what I've seen in the newspapers and on the, on the web and stuff like that. And um, I, I just, my friends from Made in Space are here and uh, I, idea, but I wanted to include them, but I have no idea what their valuation is. But their work on the station, the metric, one of the metrics is you take made in space. And when you take the fact that they have a 3D printer, well, okay, that's cool, but you know, a lot of kids have 3D printers now. Okay, what gives it a valuation, what makes it interesting, is not even what they're doing on the space station today, it's what does it open up for tomorrow and changes the way we think about uh, doing uh, space utilization and in-space services in the future. You start talking about not needing as much up mass, you start talking about uh, uh, being able to do things almost instantly, and have a, a wrench produced on the space station, um, th there's both a need and there's both a valuation. And that's what commercial is bringing to the table. So some thoughts on what's necessary for the customers and the owners. Uh, when I was working at Mircorp, 
uh, when the MIR was deorbited, we had $170 million in uh, assigned revenue. And I would say that the cost of operating the MIR at that time, this is 1999, 2000, was probably about that. We were probably breaking even. If we had stayed aloft and in orbit and we had realized that revenue, we would have probably about broken even. I'd say it's about $200 million in 1999 dollars at that time. Um, and so you can't consider a true commercial uh, venture without low, making sure your costs for operations are as low as possible. There has, it has to be efficient. You know, we're not going to be able in the future to go to NASA, the U.S. government speaking as American here from an American perspective, and ask for operate, funding for operations. You're going to have to operate this thing uh, at an even pace. We have to have government as customer. Let's just agree, let's take a vote, New Space 2015, government as customer is okay, it's commercial. Uh, it's okay, it's good, it's necessary. There is no, I mean, this is not the only industry that, that depends on the government, you know, as a, as a, uh, as a principal customer. And, and uh, it's absolutely necessary for the foreseeable future. We are going to need government help on the spa space transportation. Um, but as we look out on looking at commercial platforms, we envision just like today at Nanoracks, we receive no funding from NASA or the US government, but we do envision getting money for our services. Follow the market. Everybody for 20 years, the first major breakthrough on space station would be discover the cure for cancer. Everybody knows it, everybody knew it. We found out Japanese had this great CubeSat deployer. Uh, we tried it, our first customer was Vietnamese. And after that, wow, everybody wanted to deploy. And guess what? The first major breakthrough in utilization on the station was CubeSat deployment. It had a time, it had a place, it's helped American industry, it's helped international. Uh, we've flown Peru, we've flown Lithuania, we introduced Lithuania to space, uh, we helped Spira get going, is nano satisfy. And so if you're talking about a commercial platform, you can't go in there with preconceived notions. And this is the problem when Congress and, and government is directing. Uh, they set goals, they, they fund hardware, and it could turn out that that hardware doesn't have a relevance to the, to the users, or it may turn out that something else that's developed in the meantime. I'm not even sure CubeSats existed. I guess not when ISS was first you know, planned and, and developed. And the Japanese, had, JAXA had the foresight to put in a CubeSat deployer, and they made it so it fit a 3U because no one could envision there would be a need for more than occasional CubeSat deployment. Well, that turned out to be wrong. And the private sector could move fast. We saw the need. We went to NASA. We went to JAXA. We didn't ask for funding. We said, would you give us permission if we take the chance? And we invested about a million dollars. And for us, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and, uh, and so we've shown a win for industry and a win for utilization. So you have to follow the market. The point here is you can't say, I'm gonna, you know, you can't have a group of people telling you where to go. You have to follow what the customer base is. Um, you need a good story. That is something that government completely does not understand. Completely does not get that it's not just availability. It's there's gotta be a story. A, a person has to give you money and they give you money for a reason. Whether if it's space tourism, it's aspiration, it's your dreams, it's personal fulfillment. If it's biofarm, you're shortening the time period. Um, but even in the examples of biofarm or others, they don't wanna be associated with something that may not tell a good story. And, and they wanna, in the beginning, the International Space Station told a great story of cooperation, partnership with former enemies and and today it's getting a little the waters are getting a little choppy and and that's going to be an interesting next couple of years and you know I hope that with our, our good friends in Russia and the, and the space community we get through this period but uh, you have to be able to tell a good story else uh, utilization is just not possible um, and then the ability to grow space platforms um, as the market grows there's two uh, um, 
options there. One, if it's not a government-funded facility, you build it only as big as the market supports and the projected growth. ISS was built for political purposes. Every member of the nation made a contribution. It's big. It's expensive. And so building the ISS, I would have started with a little, you know, f uh, flyer, a free flyer, and said that's Japanese, that's uh, Russian. That's that, and built it as we went along because I'm always worried about making sure that your revenue is greater than your costs. Is a concept, okay? Um, have a good purpose, okay? Um, again, it goes back to the story. Um, ISS, ISS ha has a mixed message, not as much today, but the message in the beginning was a political. For our European friends, ISS was almost purely political. They were doing it to work with the Americans, and then later it became the Russians. For us, it was both political, suddenly, we're working with the Russians, and yes, it was the utilization, the dream of, of breakthroughs and pharmaceutical uh, discoveries. And we had mixed messages, depending whether you were the White House, whether you were Congress, or whether you were a researcher trying to use the space station. You need, uh, in commercial, as we move forward, you need a story. Is it a hotel? Is it something to take space tourists? Fine, that's what it is. Is it a biopharma workshop? Is it a, a satellite deployer that's sitting up there? Is it Earth observation, situational awareness? You need to be able to go in and say, this is what it is, you're the customer, and everything is And a diversity of location. Uh, ISS, uh, my colleagues at Nanoracks always refer to ISS as the Goldilocks orbit. No one's really satisfied with it, uh, but you know what? It's great, turns out to be good for Earth observation. Uh, but it was selected because it, it would allow the Russians to get to the uh, station here. Um, that's great. Now we're going to have two, we're going to have the ISS and we're going to have the Chinese. That's good. We need three locations. We need four locations. And so one of the things that uh, I'm hopeful is that in the next decade, next 15 years, that uh, there'll be a multiplicity of locations where you can go depending on your commercial or strategic needs. And um, finally, I, I, whenever I speak, I put in a plug for my favorite thing that you know, most of you know nothing about, the IGA. The IGA is the Intergovernmental Agreement. It's how the space station runs. And I call it the Magna Carta of space. Okay, it has survived 10, 15 years. It has some wonderful provisions. Section 8 is a waiver of third party liability. You can't get sued. If uh, we put a product up there and it uh, does something bad, uh, I can't get sued, Nanorax can't get sued, the, the person that developed the payload uh, is, is, it can't get sued. There's other provisions that have clearly withstood the test of time, and there's nothing that can be said more as a compliment to a legal document in that it's worked for 15, 20 years now. And uh, I can suggest some improvements, uh, you know, for one is that there's no discussion of taking money. It's unclear how Nanoracks can pay NASA uh, for sometimes for services on the station. Um, it's unclear how I could pay Roscosmos at times. And so I, I just want to always put in that when you think of destinations, and it's wonderful to think of asteroid mining and, and lunar colonies. One of the key questions for someone like me that lives in the day-to-day -day of space station uh, operation is under what legal framework? Okay, and it's a very important question even now today for the Earth observation community. Uh, as we're seeing more and more private capital funding going to Earth observation, they're beginning to ask questions like, what is the exact legal regime that we're working on? Who truly does own the data? How do you do the cutoff switch? Uh, is that permissible? Uh, and in my business, my sector of the marketplace, you know, it's about ownership. You know, do we really own the hardware on the International Space Station? You know, uh, that has some implications. Um, so, it's the, so the legal regime is in one sense boring, but it's terribly exciting for me because that's how you get investor capital. The more that the, there's un, the, the more that the basic questions that we assume here on the ground uh, are answered up in space, the more investors that you'll get and more sophisticated investors. Um, so really just sort of wrapping it up, um, we've spent, we've had a, we've had a wonderful time of maybe, 
you know, 10 or 12 years or something with the space station uh, up there. Uh, extraordinarily stable time. We, here in the States, we've had bipartisan support. Uh, it's one of the few areas where the White House and Congress work together. It's one of the few areas where uh, some of the nations work together. It really is an extraordinary story. Um, but at some point, it will come to an end. And the question that I think the panel that I'm on as well coming up next is going to talk about is, you know, how do you make that transition? Um, how do we make sure there's no gap going on like we had with the shuttle um, uh, and with Skylab, et cetera, et cetera? Um, we're building up momentum on the station. We're building up new users, exciting ideas, private capital, valuation. Uh, uh, it's an extraordinary story. And if we goof this, if we blow this, and we come down or stop ISS before there's something uh, that's there next, we'll just start back at zero again, or this time it will be over. And, uh, or to put it more bluntly, we'll leave to other nations to, to control the LEO utilization. So at Nanorax, uh, you know, tomorrow is today. We're focused on space stations. We're focused on destinations. Uh, we're focused on building the customer base. Uh, we're asking the questions about legal regime, investment, capital. We have customers now questioning, how much money do I put into station? If station's coming down 2024, 20, I'll put X amount in. If it's coming down 2028, 20, uh, we'll put in more. So very real questions, which is a great sign of the health uh, of, um, you know, the only space station up there right now. Um, so that's really it. Uh, that's where we are on destinations and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. A couple of space organizations that have suggested that we replace, augment and replace the NSS with a policy similar to the COTS program that was used to develop Falkland. The government does partial funding, but the end result is privately owned and operated, and then the government becomes anchor tenant. Is that a good model? Is that a bad model? What do you think? I think you said three key words that make most people at NASA and Congress go crazy. Okay, I mean, from anchor tenant to, you know, uh, partially funded. I mean, in, in, in theory, what, what you're saying, I'll put in language that's more palatable, I think, today in Congress and in NASA, uh, where you say, look, we have to get to the next level. We're going to need some public funding of this. But we don't want to own it. We don't want to control it. And, and we'll put in some public money, I think Congress may say at one point, if you and the private sector step up, put in some funding, and, but you just can't never say the word anchor, to, those days are gone, anchor tenant, it's a taboo word, okay? And, uh, and, and, and so, uh, yes, that's probably one direction we're going, and nanoracks, we don't like that. We don't want government funding. It, uh, to develop your hardware, if, if they could do it in a manner where they truly do let you develop your, uh, uh, your hardware, run it, operate it, it's different than launch vehicles, because as I'm explaining, it's a home, it's a house, it's, it's got laws, it's got people, it's got, so we're nervous about that. But if it can be done, it can be, if it can be done correctly, then of course that is the way to go. Some of the, what are some of the um, elements or some of the negotiating factors that went into moving away from selling through RFP to selling the way you're selling now? Oh, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, we went to NASA five years ago and uh, we saw that the station was being underutilized. And um, I just think, you know, especially when you have a home in space, the government was just moving too slow. And they were still focused on ending the construction process. And we went to NASA five years ago and said, we have a proposition for you. Uh, we don't, I said, we don't want your money. And that got their attention, okay? <laughs> and we said, let us build our own hardware or buy our own hardware. We'll buy it. We'll put it up on the station. Let us market to whom we choose, as long as we honor the respect of being part of the U.S. National Lab. And um, to our surprise, and perhaps to NASA's surprise, they said yes. And so it was a short circuit. I mean, it wasn't a long, it was just, here's, here's a proposition. We'll put our money in. And today, Nanorax is probably in for about $20 million now uh, if some of these projects go forward uh, uh, on station. Small amount of money, but a big amount of money. 
That's, uh, and so we were able to do what we wish uh, with an extent with that hardware. So it wasn't a long, drawn out discussion. It was just, okay, let's try it. We started small with nano labs, not a lot of money on the table. Let's just see, and we just grown, 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 grown. So, yes, sir. It seems that NanoRax is pretty tightly bound to the International Space Station. Do you have any projects in the works that would kind of, you know, break that paradigm and allow you to do free flyers and things of that nature? Yeah, well, the first thing is uh, we announced yesterday, I'm really pleased that Blue Origin uh, has uh, chosen to uh, uh, team with us, allowing Nanorax to do the business development for Blue Origin and uh, to do the um, uh, payload development. And so, yes, we're looking to, to move, and uh, Blue, the new Shepard is the first platform. So thank you. I'm being signaled that. So thank you. <laughs>